Hello, this is Karen Launchbaugh at the University of Idaho. Uh, we're at the Rangeland Principles class, and in a previous uh, lesson, we talked about um, rangelands of the Pacific region, the Intermountain region, and then the Great Basin. Today, we're going to switch to the other side of the Rockies and get into the Great Plains, and then we'll swing down into the Southwest deserts. Okay, remember that we're looking at these range regions according to major biomes in the U.S. So we're going to be in that middle central area, mostly in that grassland savanna. And then we'll move down to that dark brown area on the bottom of the screen here, the deserts and semi-deserts. The reason that we look at these regions by climate is because the climate patterns determine the, the kind of plants that are out there and the biomass. And so we will continue to examine these regions. And today we are going to be in the Great Plains. We'll talk about that climate and the Southwest Desert climate. Also recall that the regions that we're looking at were first laid down by Kukler in a map in the mid 1900s. And today uh, we'll look at the short grass prairie, the mixed prairie, the tall grass prairie. And then we'll be down into the, the desert shrublands. Okay, so here's a simplified map of Kuklers. The specific regions that we are going to work on are the prairies and the Great Plains. And let's start with the short grass prairie. Okay, the shortgrass prairie is this long band that's just on the, the east side of the Rockies. And you can see by the climate diagrams, if you start at the north um, in Miles City, Montana, one of the distinctive things is that, you know, three inches of rain uh, is the top of this graph. So throughout the year, they get just a, a few inches of rain a year. It comes mostly as spring rain, but also um, as compared to other climates that we've looked at, it, there's quite a lot of rain in the summer. And when you go down to the bottom graph, that's Amarillo, Texas. So it's on the bottom side of the short grass prairie. And um, notice how much moisture there is during the summer. Still not a lot, but, but uh, certainly moisture in the summer. So here's some uh, pictures of the short grass prairie. They're just these really broad vistas. And one thing that characterizes the prairie often is just that it'll be very, very broad. But then you'll have these beautiful um, the buttes that kind of are always on the horizon. So some characteristics of the prairie. I mentioned it was low rainfall, um, 12 to 20 inches per year. So not as low as the deserts, but still pretty low. And that's because it's in the rain shadow of the Rocky Mountains. The plants there, because of the climate they um, evolved in, and also because of heavy grazing by bison, the native plants that exist in the shortgrass prairie are really well adapted to both drought and pretty heavy grazing. So these ecosystems look um, largely the same as they have for hundreds of years because they can have adapted to those tough conditions. Fire is important in most all of the prairies, but not as important in the short grass prairie because uh, although there were fires, there weren't always there wasn't always a lot of biomass to, to create these really large extensive fires. So fire is in the prairie, but but not as important as other prairies. So it's called the short grass because it has two really signature short grasses that characterize much of the prairie, the blue grama and buffalo grass. We'll learn more about those two plants. So here's some examples of just some major plants and animals that you might find in the short grass prairie. I already mentioned blue grama and buffalo grass as being the two really dominant grasses of the prairies. And then uh, just another plant that you would see throughout um, one of the a lot of the lower country would be Western Yara. We've seen it in other regions, but certainly is something that we see commonly in the short grass prairie. I mentioned uh, bison as being a really signature animal of the plains and certainly of the short grass prairie. Uh, we'd have seen herds and herds of bison and there still are bison farms and bison preserves throughout the short grass prairie. Um, the pronghorn, uh, which we often think of as, as kind of a western sagebrush animal, really is well adapted to the prairies, those such as the short grass prairie. So it's really common to see herds of bison in, say, eastern Wyoming and eastern Montana. And then, of course, because when you're out on the prairie, you've got prairie dogs and you've got holes that um, birds like the burrowing owl can use. Those three main animals you might find on the prairie. Okay, let's move now just a little further east to that central band that goes down uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, and then into Texas. That would be the mixed prairie. Look at these di uh, climate diagrams. You'll see that the top of the diagram is four inches now, so it's, it's more precipitation than the uh, short grass prairie. But also notice that the 
majority of precip is, is right there in the middle of the summer. So that's important because that, that's a characteristic of the Great Plains climate, where, that you have moisture during the growing season. So here's some beautiful uh, pictures of the prairie. Um, bison, of course, mentioned they're an important feature of the mixed prairie and of the short grass prairie. And uh, there is some invasion from some woody plants. We're starting to get a little bit more um, moisture. So in the valleys and uh, in some of the more the deeper soils, you might start to see uh, woody plants, pines and, and juniper. And then we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the sh shallow wetlands that are important in the mixed prairie. I wonder why it's called mixed. Well, it's it's called the mixed prairie just because it really is a mix of different uh, grasses, tall, mid, and short grasses. It's also a mix of cool season and warm season plants, and then it's a mix of plant communities across the landscape. Um, I mentioned that the, the the shallow wetlands are very important here. So the prairie pothole region is in the mixed prairie. The playas of the panhandles of Texas and Oklahoma would be in the prairie region. So th this is a really important area for migratory waterfowl uh, going up and down the Great Plains. Uh, the soils are mostly mollusols, but there are some more arid uh, places. So you might have some aridosols and entosols also. So um, along with that mix of different vegetation types, you have a mix of soil types too. So plants also evolved with heavy grazing uh, by bison. So therefore, they are well adapted to grazing. Um, also, the Great Plains climate helps plants that are grazed during the growing season because there's moisture during the, gra uh, the, during the growing season. So plants that are grazed uh, will often get that summer moisture that allows them to recover and, and grow more photosynthetic material after they've lost it from grazing. Wildfires are his were historically very common. Again, we had um, moisture in the summer, so we'd have those rolling lightning storms, thunderstorms that would grow across the plains and um, create wildfires that might go on for miles. Animals and plants you might see in the mixed prairie. Uh, again, we have a mix, so we might see some blue grama, some little blue stem, uh, which would be kind of a mid, mid grass. Uh, uh, in this picture is also a needle and thread, which is a, a mid sized grass. And then we would still have plants like western yarrow, but one of the more um, problematic plants of the mixed prairie is leafy, leafy spurge. It's something that came into um, much of these ecosystems in the late 1900s, in the 1970s and 80s, and now it dominates many of the lower areas in the prairie. Some animals you might see on the prairie, bison, of course, uh, pronghorn still, red tail hawks, a lot of hawks throughout this area, and then um, uh, animals such as grasshoppers, really common, a variety of grasshoppers. Okay, now let's take a look at the tall grass prairie. Uh, you can see by this diagram, it's sort of centered along the northern part of the Mississippi River, and it uh, has a, a appendage that kind of goes out into Iowa, top of Missouri, and into Illinois. So it, it's in a really moist area, and if you look on the climate diagrams, you can see that it's throughout the growing season. The moisture is uh, throughout the summer, so the the bars of precipitation kind of follow the temperatures. And you can see that the highs are in the five or six inches per year. So this is one of the most, well, it is the most type, uh, most moist type of the of prairie that we have. So here's some beautiful pictures of the prairie. Um, that moisture does give rise to very tall grasses over a person's head. And uh, it also a lot of wildflowers because they get a lot of moisture during the growing season. They have wildflowers throughout the whole season. Talk a little bit more about fire, but fire really is important in this uh, in this region. Okay, a few take home points of the tall, about the tall grass prairie. One, as mentioned, it is the most uh, moist of all the um, prairie types that we're going to look at. Uh, it's 20 to 30 inches, can even be up to 35 inches of precip per year. Um, it is well adapted. These uh, plants are well adapted to fire and drought because even though there is moisture, there can be long periods where there's not enough moisture. And uh, fire is really important in maintaining the, these grasslands because uh, fire uh, keeps the shrubs out of the grass. Grasses are more adapted to fire than shrubs. So when fires go through, it keeps those uh, largely invasive shrubs from taking over the prairie. Uh, the plants of the prairie were well adapted to grazing and fire. Uh, so they evolved with bison and they have mechanisms to 
keep their meristems low and, and uh, be adapted to fire. Also remember that there is moisture during the growing season. So if uh, plants are eaten during the summer, they have resources to recover from the loss of photosynthetic material. The grasses are very productive. The soil is a very rich mollusol because the roots went down into the soil and, and uh, really created a lot of organic matter and really rich soil. And also because it's often just rolling plains, it was easily plowed and converted to cropland. The bottom line is with that rich soil and that rolling topography created a situation where these uh, lands were quickly converted to cropland and today probably less than 5% exist as they once were. So we've got about remnant prairies that account for about 5% of the original prairie. The Kanza Prairie in Kansas is one of the largest remnants in case you ever get a chance to visit. Some major plants from the tall grass prairie, as mentioned, it's called the tall grass prairie. So it has a, a couple of plants that are really important. Big blue stem is the one that we will take a look at in this class, but Indian grass is also another dominant plant of the tall grass prairie, as is switchgrass and a few others. Um, prairie coneflower is something that's seen throughout the prairie. A lot of beautiful wildflowers and prairie coneflowers is one of those that would be really common. Some animals you might see in the tall grass prairie, uh, something like red fox uh, would be one of the mesocarnivores in that system. Uh, bison, of course, historically and today, and, and of course cattle graze what, what prairies exist. Now to give you a chance to really look at the prairie, take a look at this video about Americans grass, grasslands. It was created by Native Prairie Public Broadcasting. Prairie Go to u2.be forward slash xq9d1s8 small case sm7 whatever stop. In the world. We've lost just tremendous amounts of native grass in this area. And the saying is that anyone can love the mountains, but it takes soul to love the prairie. Nowhere are the grasslands more intact in this region than that landscape called the Missouri Coteau. It's that matrix of wetlands and grasslands that attract waterfowl to the region, uh, provide the resources both for food and for habitat for nesting in, and therefore they are the very best of the best habitats that we have left in this part of the world. Mallard! We found five or six nests today, which just in the short time that we were searching was pretty good. This is good nesting habitat, thick vegetation as a result of all the rain. A real concern I have is the amount of true native grass that's being broke and converted, and when I say broke, turned to farm ground and converted to cropland. There's a real push for more crops. Uh, grain crops are obviously more profitable than the average cattle operation the last couple of years. This is an example of a native prairie pasture that had uh, supported livestock for the last uh, uh, hundred plus years. And just this spring, they were sprayed down with herbicide to kill the native sod and soybeans were planted. Just in the last five years, we've lost almost 400,000 acres of native prairie in North and South Dakota. That's a substantial amount, and if that rate continues, a large percentage will be lost over the, a period of a couple decades. The question is, how much grassland can we lose before sort of the whole grassland-based ag economy doesn't remain sustainable, and then we see just you know, wholesale loss of it as you know, there's no cattle barn to take your cows to. There's not enough pasture to maintain the, the large herds of cows that we have now. And if we see that, we'll see huge detrimental impacts on the wildlife population. I have a concern, not just because I'm a rancher, but because I run a livestock auction market. And when I see grass get torn up, that's just that many fewer cattle that it might have a chance to come through my sale. So now along comes the 
the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and, and other donors uh, like Ducks Unlimited and said, we want to reward guys that, for good stewardship of keep taking care of the grass. So it wasn't a hard decision because it really it wasn't going to alter any of our operations. There's interest from landowners to protect these areas. That's sort of consistent with their view of how this land should be used. And really, we just need the funding to sort of get that job done. I wanted to be able to help Ducks Unlimited accomplish uh, grassland and wetland conservation. It was probably one of the greatest feelings that I've ever had is to be able to do something so positive and something that will um, have meaning for, for a very long time. I knew that the money would go towards grassland conservation and I knew that it would be well used. I've said to, to many of my colleagues in Ducks Unlimited that I couldn't think of a, a better organization to give that money to. It's about the future. We, that's, there's no other way to look at things because we have a responsibility, I think, to ensure that all of our children, the children of the world, have uh, wild places. They have grasslands and wetlands so that they continue to be able to recreate in them, to gain the benefits from them. A land ethic that Aldo Leopold talked about. The soil has to be well taken care of, the grass has to be well taken care of, the water has to be well taken care of, and that'll sustain life. And that means all life, from the tiniest little insect to the most powerful species on the planet, us. I hope that 40 years from now, we can say, boy, we were wise to hang on to some of this because we really need it for clean water, for clean air, for livestock production, for wildlife, and for all the good reasons that we have natural resources. Now let's turn our attention to some of the desert shrublands. We're gonna focus mostly on the Southwest desert and a couple of interesting features you'll see here. The, certainly it's drier, it's a desert. So if you look at this climate diagram, the most you might ever the, these areas would receive in the winter i'm sorry uh, during any month would be two maybe two and a half inches a month uh, and so annually they're less than say 12 14 inches another interesting thing about the climate is that now we're getting what they call monsoonal rain so we're starting to get rains in august and september uh, rather than early in the spring the dominant season of for rain would be july august september in this class, we've talked before about um, deserts, uh, the cold deserts in the Great Basin, sagebrush steppe, salt desert shrub would both be considered desert shrublands. They're in the cold desert. Now let's turn our attention to the hot desert. We're going to talk about the Mojave, the Sonoran, and the Chihuahuan, which would all be hot deserts. Start uh, first with Mojave up on the top there. Mojave um, is a uh, desert that's in Southern California, Southern uh, Nevada, also been in Arizona. And it's an uh, interesting uh, iconic plant of the Sonoran, or I'm sorry, of the Mojave Desert is uh, Joshua Tree. It's a large yucca plant, actually. So that would be a plant that we might expect to see in the Mojave. Also, a lot of creosote bush, which we'll talk about later. Sonoran Desert uh, down in, uh, to, in Arizona and uh, down in New Mexico. Uh, the main iconic plant of that ecosystem is the saguaro cactus. Also, a desert coach's whip um, it is also in this uh, picture that you see down in the left-hand corner. Um, but that saguaro cactus is certainly a signature plant of that desert. Uh, if you move further east to the Chihuahuan Desert, um, one of the plants you would definitely see would be lots of cactus and especially prickly pear cactus, along with a lot of other understory shrubs. Uh, fire is not common in the desert uh, because there's not, you hasn't been historically a lot of um, uh, vegetation between plants to sustain fires. 
However, just like in the Northwest, uh, a, a, an invasive annual has come in. In the Southwest, the, pro, uh, the major problem is red brome, Bromus rubens. It increases the fuel between plants and therefore makes this ecosystem more susceptible to fire. The problem with that is that these plants are not adapted to fire. So plants like the Joshua tree on these left-hand pictures, not adapted to fire. When fire comes through, they're lost to fire. So um, increasing fire frequency is a problem in these desert ecosystems.